forever. Dog. I remember doing a scene somewhere in season two where uh, at the end of the scene, I mean, I saw it on the screen because I didn't, I, that I, I was literally bouncing, bouncing, doing this thing with, that I didn't do. My body did this because that was the character. I didn't, I wasn't consciously thinking of moving and grooving and doing what it, so if you're in character, your body will do what it's supposed to do. That's great. It was, and I went, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Household Faces, the podcast where a character actor interviews other character actors. I'm your host, John Ross Bowie. You might know me from The Big Bang Theory or Speechless or a couple episodes of the NBC show About a Boy, where I played Fiona's boss, Fiona at the time being played by Minnie Driver. And that's how we met. And that probably gave me an edge when it came time to audition for Speechless. So yeah, it all connects, man. Our guest is Steven Root. I mean, where do you start with Stephen Root? Well, we start with Barry. We do Office Space. We cover a little West Wing. We cover News Radio. Yes, we cover George Romero's Monkey Shines. We talk about the transition from Shakespeare to sitcoms. It is a really tight, fun conversation with a guy who I actually met a few years ago on a show that we both happened to be guest starring on, and we'll touch on that as well. Please welcome Stephen Root. I, you strike me. We were just talking about the the nightmare feeling of of waking up too late for your call time. Oh my god! Especially when you're on location. Especially when you're yeah, like you're in Toronto or you're Vancouver, or whatever. Guest, let's just say Canada. Yeah. Um, and you so you're sort of a guest in somebody's house, somebody's right. country, right? And then you're and I feel like you're the sort of actor who really prides himself on his punctuality, being on time. Yeah. Big thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. Big thing for me, and big thing for. Uh, it, it's hard because if your spouse is the kind that likes to get to the airport right to walk onto the plane no, and you, you. want to be the guy that's there no, thank in plenty you. of time. Why would you leave any room for error at the airport, particularly uh-huh. now? Yeah, that's a conversation I've had 150 times. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm team you on that. I don't want to get involved in your marriage. Not your at marriage all. Is your business. And she knows. But... It's okay. okay. Yeah, okay. It's all good. Okay. I was reading... I just actually started this book, um, big onerous book on the method by Isaac Butler. Okay, it just came out, and it's it starts with the origin story and you know a letter that Nemirovich sent to Stanislavski. But the five tenets they started for the Moscow Art Theater, the fifth one was be on time. Be on time. Just be on time, man. Mm-hmm. It's like be on time, be prepared, be on time. and you may be able to stay in the business. Yeah, but both of those things have to happen. Well, I think you can be. We're going off on a tangent that I didn't expect to start this early. But I think what I have found, and tell me if you think this is right, you can be late and a pain in the ass as long as you are making other people a ton of money. That's correct. But the second that stops, mm-hmm. then you're then just you a pain stop. in the ass. Yeah, then, then you, you stop. stop. Yeah. yeah. Then you're not worth the hassle. Exactly. And and people need to <laughs> it's again, it's the, we cannot be reminded enough that it is called show business. business. It is not called show friends. And it's you can have a career or you can have been in show business for five minutes and be in a pain in the ass. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, the uh-huh. a, a very common thread among our guests is that they have careers and they have been at this for a while and they get there by being consistently easy to work with, even if they're not, you know, the person who's going to get their film green lit, you know? Sure. Um, but let's start with, um, we'll sort of bounce around chronologically. I'm not caught up on Barry, but I, I love it so much. I think you'll really, it's deep this season. I've I think heard, you'll love it. Yeah, yeah. I've heard. it's. Um, it gets deeper. It actually reminds me of Breaking Bad in the way it gets a little darker and a little scarier with each passing season. Kind of has to with the lead as PTSD. <laughs> right. You know, absolutely. <laughs> you know? <laughs> absolutely. And you find out more about how he got there. Right. And what's interesting about it is that it could so easily be a perfectly solid hour and 45 minute feature comedy. Mm-hmm. But what keeps it from doing the hitman wants to be an actor is dimensionalizing all the characters around him. Correct. And I want to talk about Fuchs for a moment because he's such an interesting guy. His loyalties shift constantly, so our loyalties shift constantly. Mm-hmm. There are times when we're rooting for him, and he's he's you know we we pity him, and there's times where he's a fucking snake. Right. How do you? 
I'm going to ask a real acting 101 thing here. How do you motivate that? How, what is the motivation for playing Fuchs? Uh, good writing starts with it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, it always does. And then, and then it's, if that continues, you're able to find the different colors in the characters if the writing is good. Um, and, and on this show, you were able to have input in that with Bill and Alec. Okay. Uh, uh, and we also learned that lesson very early when we did the pilot. And I wasn't playing this guy in the pilot. I was playing a screaming asshole right. only. Uh, and and that was fun. Sure. Uh, but HBO and Bill and Alec went, well, if he's at 11, where's, where, where, where are we going to go? There, right. So uh, they retooled it into Bad Uncle. So you could start. So you could start with Buddy. I, I need you to do this for me. <laughs> and that gives me to go yeah. finally to 11, which I get to several times. Yeah, no, and there's a couple moments in season two when you're, spoiler alert, incoming, when you're encouraging him <laughs> to off that kid. Correct. You know, where where if you, you can't come out of the gate like that. Which becomes a linchpin of the whole series. Yeah, yeah. it would have to. Um, yeah. What, um, yeah, so that's amazing. So did they reshoot your scenes in the pilot? They did. Wow. They did. Um, you recognize how lucky you were to just not get recast. Completely. Okay. I th- had a feeling you might. that. Okay. Yeah. But they're um, like, we want to keep this guy. We want a mm-hmm. different version of this guy. We don't want this version of this guy. But I think we had enough fun with the other version of the guy that they said, well, he, he can do this. He's He's been in a couple other things. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I always feel very blessed that they didn't say, uh, hit the road, Jack. Because he's on time. Because I was on he's time. Punctual, and that makes. And I would do some of my stunts. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. You're also sitting here with a, a back a a pillow back. in your lower back. Uh, uh, that's yeah. okay. We'll, we'll get to. We'll that's get to mainly how that age. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to how that happened as well. Let me talk. Let's talk a little bit more about the tone on set then. Um, Hader and Berg obviously have a pretty clear cut vision for this show. Supremely. But you also say it's very collaborative. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, they they want you to be able to be free within the confines of what they're thinking of. Um, you know, because Bill will come in one day and say for a scene that you're completely prepared for, and he'll go, I don't like any of this. What would you say here? So um, uh, you're, 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 put in the position to be a collaborator immediately. Right. Uh, and if you don't have an improv background, that's harder to do. For me, I came from Shakespeare and straight plays and right. theater in New York. But it was a great tool to be able to learn even at this advanced age to, you know, just let it go. You know Fuchs at this point. Just yeah. go, what would you say? What would you do? And, that, and we did that several times, have done it. Um, when we see a script, we're able to give input and say, I don't know if he would, um, which is amazing. You know, you don't get to do that on 90% of the shows that, that right. you do. Yeah, yeah, I'd say about 90. Right. What, I, there's moments where I'm watching Fuchs and he's almost like, he's a, a scavenger rat almost. And he be, is. Because you're talking so much about your theater background and I know you have a, a, you have a BFA I don't. You don't I, wait. I don't. You have I was an honorary in, BFA. I, I was in the BFA program. I only got an AA because I left to go do National Shakespeare Company in oh, New, in York, New York, York City. City. Oh, okay. Correct. Interesting. In that time, getting getting your AA, did you find yourself doing animal exercises or anything like that? We did all that stuff. Yeah. You know, in college that you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it, it feel, it's funny because that's the thing that like that non-actors make fun of actors for all the time. It's I don't like, blame them. Yeah, I don't blame them at all. It's <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. And and the hope is that you never, ever see the means. You just see the end. Because mm-hmm. God forbid they see us crawling around on the floor. But but there is a, there is a quality of the desperate animal to Fuchs sometimes. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. if it's so in your bones right now that you don't even realize you're doing it. Mm. Yeah, and I, I've, I've, I've talked to some other people about this. I remember doing a scene somewhere in season two, where uh, uh, at the end of the scene, I mean, I saw it on the screen because I didn't, that I I was literally bouncing, bouncing, doing this thing with that I didn't do. My body did this because that was the character. I didn't, I wasn't consciously thinking of 
moving and grooving and doing what. I, so if you're in character, your body will do what it's supposed to do. That's great. It was, and I went, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> do, you, do you find it? Can you, are, are you are one of those actors who can watch themselves? Once. Oh, okay. Once. Interesting. Okay. Once. Um, I, I, because as most actors will tell you, uh, all I see is, why didn't they use that take? Or I did this better. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, on this show, I've watched it more than once because I'm proud of the work on this show. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of the very few that I would watch again, I think. That's neat to hear. I'm yeah. not surprised. Yeah, it's a, it's a very nuanced, um, I mean, you're all so good. There are no small parts on that on that show. I try desperately not to read scripts very carefully, so I could just watch them as a fan because I'm a fanboy. Yeah, of the show. Yeah, and no, it it it. There's an enthusiasm running through it, and just the like, every single student in in Gene's class has a moment that is so pure and true, mm -hmm. satirical, mm -hmm. yes, but anchored in in so much L.A. truth. Such good, good actors they got for this show and yeah. continue to get yeah um let's talk about um well let's talk about florida um you went to high school in florida you bounced I, around a lot yeah I, my dad was i was construction brat instead of a military brat okay did steam power plants took a year and a half whoop go to another whoop do another so i i was basically a, a military brat all over the southeast all over well all mostly ended up in the midwest i was i was very Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Wyoming, okay. and then this last job, which took me out of my senior year of high school, ripped me out of that, oh, and put me in Florida. I wasn't happy with that. Uh, so, and it cost nothing to go to University of Florida in 1970. Wow. Didn't cost a lot of money, so it was a state school. So that's where I ended up. Did you go in with an eye on theater? Not a bit. Never. No, no. Okay. Uh, I was the school photographer. I thought maybe in that journalism, so I signed up for journalism major. Uh, but like a lot of people, just took an elective and went. Uh, you know, and the student directors would go, "Will you come in and do this?" I okay, and then and then you get bit, right? And you yeah. get up there and you get a laugh or you get a gasp, and yeah, that's and you it. go, "I think I could do this." Yeah, and what's a little more um, instant gratification than photography, uh, which is a lovely art. Very we, much so. We have a lot of people who come into the show who are big into the visual arts. Sure. Um, Yul Vasquez, Xander Berkeley have, have come Xander's in to do right. the show. Yeah. Xander's a terrific painter. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a lot that they get from that. What did, what did you get from photography that you find yourself bringing to, uh, to theater, to acting? Uh, uh, to appreciate the eye of the cinematographer mm. you know he's he, i i love to to that's the first person i want to see and and he shows you well it's going to be this yeah gonna be this you're going to come in here and this and the picture and it's like uh, from doing photography i get that i get that and uh can appreciate it having done and i'm, I'm on camera here so i can i can do it. having done theater Multicam mm. and drama. Mm. Do you find yourself adjusting your performance with That's frame size? That's a great question. Yes, I mean because I came from straight theater, which was you know back to the wall, right? Uh, especially um, doing really really big barns like in Boston and yeah. you know really big houses. You have I, a couple of Broadway credits, right? A couple of Broadway credits, and I did uh, the national tour of Daisy, Driving Miss Daisy. Oh, okay. Um, with Julie Harris and Brock Peters. I mean, two of oh, the wow. greatest stage actors ever. Yeah, yeah. And we played every, you know, all over for two years. But that was a great training. But that was pretty much the end of my theater career because at the end of that, I moved to L.A. I see. Uh, in 90. Uh, and that experience of then being guest star boy in sitcoms, you know, doing... Um, uh, Roseanne and, mm -hmm. and uh, Night Court yeah. and those kind of things are a smaller version of a theater audience. It's 200 people. Mm -hmm. So you've got to adjust your performance to that and then the close-ups that the camera is going to give you as well. So that was that was three years of learning how to do that. Just bouncing around doing guest work on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's we, we talk about the delicate alchemy of sitcom yeah. multicam acting on the yeah. show a lot. 
you know, which I guess is going to... Which you've done a lot of. I've done a ton, yeah. yeah. And I always call it theater with a safety net. Mm-hmm. It um, is. Because you, you do... Get you, to you do it again. Yeah. You do you, get to do you it do again. You do get to... And, <laughs> and, and on the worst case scenario, you screw up, the audience saw a blooper. That's fine yeah. for them. You know, don't make a habit of it. But, you know, now and again... They're fine. They're fine. Um, they get pizza. Um, <laughs> they do around what, what would be the second commercial But they break. have to endure the warm-up comic for an awfully long time. They do. They do. You know, that's okay. So there's a warm up comic <laughs> that, that keeps an audience uh, excited and jazzed uh, yeah. in uh, in a multicam audience. And there was the same guy, a guy named Mark Sweet on uh, on Big Bang Theory, sure. which is where Steve and I, I initially Mark. met. And Mark's probably the best to do it. Yeah. Um, he's a magician. He's a hypnotist. He does a but he, he gets song contests going. It's incredibly. You don't hard realize job. how hard that job is, though, yeah. until you see it done poorly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. Someone who's just like, round of applause, guys. You're like, oh, that's awful. Um, yeah. Um, you know, this is the seventh time you're seeing the scene, but let's <laughs> give it everything like, you got. On. What if these jokes were new? <laughs> so, so, all right, so you get the bug, but when do you realize? that this is something you can do for a living or does that even enter your mind? Is it just like, fuck it, I'm going to do this whether I can make a living or not? Yeah, I got it a bit bad enough that I did, you know, several big productions in college and, and I one of the first one was uh, Shrew, which was great fun. What did you do one was, uh, gr- 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 Grumio. Grumio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grumio and Shrew. And nicely, nicely, thank you, in Guys and Dolls. Oh my and, God. And just, you know, so yeah, I was already... All in by the end of my time. At Those college. are two huge scene stealing comic roles. Wonderful things. Yeah, and and I think I think probably the only thing I did in town that wasn't there was at the Hippodrome Theater, which is a big theater. It's now the State Theater of uh, Florida, um, but I got to do Charlie Brown for them. I got to do Midsummer for them. Who'd you so. play in Charlie Brown? Who'd you play in Midsummer? Charlie Brown. Nice guy. And. Uh, Tell me you're one of the mechanicals. mechanicals. Okay, yeah, good, good. I just, I don't want to, I don't want to. Had to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I want, I don't want to waste you as Lysander. Um, uh, uh, so you, so if you go to college in '70 and you don't finish, that puts you in New York like '73. No, no, uh, no, because I, I, those first two years were journalism. So, oh, really? I had, okay. Still had to go do the, you know, the three, four years of that but i didn't make it through so by uh, 75 still 75 to 70. move to new york yeah it was all i ever knew so i kind of just took that level of oh it was to, com- for granted i was in florida you know and then i was in and new not york. even in like miami you were in sarasota right Sar- uh, no no i uh, i was in uh, gainesville in, gainesville yeah, okay yeah. all right I-, I was born in sarasota but literally three weeks okay that was, that was all okay. i was there Okay. But yeah, massive so, culture shock. Massive culture shock. Okay. I mean, I was the guy that got into the bus station, you know, on 42nd. Oh my God. And Ratso Rizzo would come up and go, hey, buddy, how you doing? It's really good. I, I hate want to tell you something. Really happened. To Raised me. in the Midwest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Matriculated in Florida. You just look like, like, like less hip oh John Voight my at that point. Oh, <laughs> goodness. I was so green. Um, but fortunately, Philip Meister. And the National Shakespeare Company got me uh, situated in New York. We and I did that for three years around the country, but it was always situated in New York. But they they do an interesting thing. They they would do real spare bus and truck productions. Twelve, of, twelve uh, people. Twelve people. Twelve people on the trailways with with the set being literally four hydraulic genies curtains, a, a stairway trunk. that goes up uh-huh. and down the the end. Yeah, go. I, a friend of mine. Uh, uh, do you know Rob Cordry? I don't know Rob, but I, 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 I think he's amazing. Rob, Rob cut his teeth in the '90s doing National Shakespeare Company, touring the the country, doing. Um, I've got to talk to him. About I'm seeing it. him for lunch later. This is crazy. Yeah. Um, seeing he Phillip was doing was probably dead by then, but okay, go ahead. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, Andrew Aguecheek in Twelfth Night, and I think yeah. he did Horatio in in the Hamlet. They were Lovely. doing, and they would play. Open air like amphitheaters, sure. school gyms, gyms, 
a little room in a in a junior college, that was the best training you could possibly get. I, I would have to be right. It, it would just because you were doing a different show every night, even though it was the same show. Well, I mean, if 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 you do a run of anything in the same theater, every audience is different. But if you're moving across the country, across different venues, I can't think of anything that would build more at a. See, you say you don't have an improv background. Well, I, I kind I, of do. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. We had to improv exits and entrances and and volume control and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. But but just you had like the you had the sort of safe cushion of Shakespeare's text to to exact to lean back on you up. Yeah. Not that we didn't do modern versions of some shows. Sure. Sure. Yeah. What shows did you do? First year we did a wonderful twenties adaptation of Comedy of Errors. Great. Played the, one of the Dromeos. Oh, great! Uh, and the most beautiful show that is never done, Winter's Tale. Wow! Well, Winter's Tale's tough, man. Winter's, Winter's Tale's Winter's tough, tough, but it's the most fun to do. Why do you say that? It's a fairy tale. Yeah, it's a fairy tale with a jealous king, but it's. Uh, I don't know. I found it the most fun to do of all the dramas, and and it is a drama. Uh, we did uh, so those two and. Twelfth Night, maybe? Yeah, the first year. And the next year we did Othello and uh, Midsummer. Oh, God, it's hard to remember now. That's but, so yeah, fun, though. All that, that stuff. Such an incredible, um, just an incredible uh, training ground. Oh, the best. But you, you end up in, in L.A. And did you find yourself almost instantly working in in multicam i had to <laughs> well it's not that because we had just had a baby in 89 right on the road oh wow on okay. the road uh so i had to hit the ground uh, and book right uh, but but specifically you found yourself doing sitcom work more than hour-long drama and i stuff. did but i had come but we had sat in la for six weeks doing the show so every casting director in town had seen the work and that's when i said i've got to move right now right I i've got, got to go right now and not just a body coming in from new york it's, right. they've actually seen the work the the iron is hot i must strike. right yeah. so and and i mean i've done a lot of comedies uh in theater so it was that was the natural way to go first well that's my that is my my question i had a an acting teacher one time tell me will tell all of us that so much of the american sitcom as we understand it has its roots and its character archetypes in the commedia dell'arte mm -hmm. and you see that a lot on news radio in particular yep. mm -hmm. and you're kind of and i think i've got my archetype right sort of il datore kind of the yeah the, very the, much so. the buffoonish authority figure here yep. right very much so was that conscious were you i mean because there's something shakespearean <laughs> it really is. I loved that show. Uh, Radio my, is, it was, is... I of the two that I talk about uh, that I'm proudest most is those two, Barry and Newsweek. Really? Yeah. yeah. Then everything else is going to be downhill after this. I'm sorry. Well, but, no, um... that's okay. No, it wasn't downhill, but those no, were special. No, they really they were special. I mean, there were, and it was an ensemble. They're both ensemble pieces. Yes. You know. Yeah, and the other thing that you know, be, news radio being a, a traditional workplace comedy is an ensemble where you're all up in each other's grill constantly a genuine ensemble where the ensemble has to work together right. all the and time. everybody has to be funny with everybody else which doesn't happen all the time no that's we a very could, specific we, i could be funny with andy i could be funny with anybody andy could be funny with anybody yeah. phil could be funny with anybody yeah and what was phil like <sighs> a sweetheart mm -hmm. um a, a meticulous you know you wouldn't think coming from saturday night live which was a doggy -dog, dog atmosphere we had to beat him down a couple of times to say no it, no, we're going for the gold for everybody here, Phil. We don't want to upstage you. And it took him a year to go, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, to trust the rest of you? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but he did. Uh, but he was a guy that would have his, you know, uh, whatever the, the first script was in the folder, in different tabs, colored tabs for each scene. He was very, very meticulous and a great artist. Yeah, that's Commander right. Yeah, artist. he did the the Poco cover. That he, horse he was cover. a graphic artist before he was, he was a comedian. He was one of, one of the things I found so inspiring about him was that I I was starting improv at twenty seven when he died, but mm -hmm. I was just like about to get headshots at twenty seven, which is a relatively late start for for some people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have already decided that this is what they're going to do, 
And when he died, I was crushed, and I started reading so much, I didn't realize he'd gotten such a relatively, he was in his mid-30s before he started to take uh, Groundlings classes. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't appear on camera until I was 34. No, that's fantastic. It was all theater before that. That is great. Um, I, I, there's something about, about Hartman that I was going to say that I, I noticed, I saw an interview with him one time where he was talking about how he came to Clinton, and he he obviously has a great ear and everything, but his Clinton was an equation. It was Elvis and Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And and you listen to his Clinton, like, oh, that's exactly right, and it's Bill Clinton. You did it. You 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 actually figured out the math. So I'm mm-hmm. not surprised to find that there was a... Very meticulous side of him. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 What were... And then there was Dave Foley who could look at a script and go, okay, good, got it. Oh, really? <laughs> it's like, I want to punch him in the face every day. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so interesting, though, because, you know, he he had to be, it's such a crazy workplace. He's got to be the voice of reason. He's got right. to he, ground it. Oh, yeah. And a lot of us didn't realize he could necessarily do that coming from kids from in the kids, hall. kids, yeah. No, Dave had the hardest job on the show, which was uh, neophyte to... <laughs> to uh, used up piece of, <laughs> piece of tissue by the end of the show. No, yeah, he yeah. He, he gave it a very long, painful arc. He but did, it and was... it was brilliant. I, I give him all the props in the world. He was a tremendous actor on that show. But there was something very, um, when you started doing sitcom, was there, did you immediately realize like, oh, this is, I actually have done something like this before. This yeah, is, it this felt, is in it my It felt home. like this is within my, my wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I had somebody uh, tell me that you you audition for a sitcom by f- figuring out the the filling in the following blank. This character is the most blank person in the world, mm. and uh, that can take you to a very very big place. But if you ground it somewhat, it's a nice mm-hmm. place to start. Yeah. When you're and again, this is just like multicam sitcom. Again, we're talking about like a the old school sure. almost farcical thing. But what they're going to probably hire you for is your strength. Uh, what what your strength is? Okay, what's yours? My I mine was uh, hopefully is sometimes <laughs> uh, timing, yeah, and you know uh, not being afraid to make a complete fool of yourself, which you have to to be good. You have to you have to just look like a, a freaking idiot. Yeah, and, you know. Yeah, there's no other way around it. No, really. no vanity. You just have to. There's no vanity, no yeah. vanity, and I'm more than willing to do that because I'd played Grumio and, and all right. these other clowns. You yeah. Know, I was like, oh, bang, yeah. that's fine with me. And so you 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 massage that into whatever you want to do on a sitcom. Speaking of wonderfully unvain roles, I got to talk about Milton because everyone wants me to ask <laughs> about Milton. Um, it was, of the people, when I mentioned amazing. that I was, when I was uh, talking to you, and you know, we had Dietrich on just a couple of weeks ago, oh, I love so you Dietrich. are you are at least our second uh, Office Space alum. Um, but there's, and you'd worked with Mike Judge before. We were doing King of the Hill, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. But you hadn't done anything on camera with him. Did he make you? No, you, no. But you'd done some shorts as that character. No, nope. no. I'm wrong. Okay, no, you're wrong. He did the voice himself for the short. Oh. He did the voice himself. Yeah. And in fact, when we did the read for the network, he was going to read it. And he said, nah, I don't want to read it. You read it. <laughs> Thanks for the prep. He showed me the pencil sketch. Okay. They did they, they said, do something in this realm. And he showed you a drawing. He, he, no, he showed me a two minute pencil sketch. Oh, I see. Uh, movement. Animatic. Yeah, animatic, kind of animatic uh, yeah. black and white. Okay. Uh, and I said, okay, I, I, I get the idea of, of the guy. And I and I gave him on the spot a little lisp <laughs> and so, a couple other things, and it went down that road. What what was it about the drawing that you 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 brought a, a voice to? What was it? It wasn't the drawing. It was it was the script. The script. Okay. Uh, I completely got the script. Okay. Uh, and we had been working together on King of the Hill, doing multitudinous characters right, for right. each episode. Right. So it was easy to slip into whatever he felt like, what I, whatever he wanted to do that day. And that day it was Milton. And it just happened to be, it turned out to be a, a cult thing. So um, I've asked this question of other people before. Were you surprised at that film's second life? Uh, oh, oh, we all were. 
we were, we were doing, we figured we were doing a B comedy for a lot of fun with a lot of people that were on King of the Hill. Right, you right. Know? So um, the reason it became, I think, what it did was it was literally at the dawn of the blockbuster generation. It was, oh, yeah. it's right when Blockbuster came out. So you could see something over and over and over and over again. There was a massive, huge chain video store in your town. Right. Yeah. And you could, you could rent this movie 500 times. And people did. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became a word of mouth movie. Yeah. So that's, so. that's why, that's where its life came from. And then different, every 10 years, different generations discover it. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to matter that the computers, you know, are yeah, right. <laughs> huge motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's funny. Yeah. I, I, the argument in, in my house is my, my wife wants to show it to the kids. And I'm like, I mean, I love that movie because I worked in a bunch in, of offices, and offices in my yeah, 20s. Exactly. And, and just that moment, I fell in love with the moment where he just gets shocked on the doorknob. <laughs> Like that moment, right? And it's maybe the first five minutes of the, of the film. Yeah, that yeah. moment was like, oh, this is a genius, this is a masterpiece. This is Citizen Kane. Uh, Where has this been all my life? We, but I, I worry that my kids, um, uh, like, haven't earned this movie yet. That's what right. I'm thinking. I hear you. You know, I hear you. They just haven't had enough life experience for it yet. I, I need them to to have a couple shitty temp jobs, and then we'll. I'm sure uh, they've been we'll in a car that out. changes lanes, and yes. you don't go anywhere. But. That may be the extent of their <laughs> experience. I mean, I think it might work because you're all so good and so endearing. <laughs> and, um, uh, but oh, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, do people, do you get approached about that movie? Only that movie. Really? Literally. It, it, it may be a dodgeball every once in a while. You're virtually unrecognizable in that film, though. <laughs> Doesn't matter. That's incredible. It's really weird. Um, uh, airports, um, it's all office space. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you appear on camera for the first time when you're 34. Mm -hmm. um, is that um, is that on film or on TV? No, New York, uh, New York. Uh, soap. A soap. Okay, soap. I did a soap. All right. Uh -huh. And I, I went back and I watched a little bit of uh, uh, Monkey Shines. The, first movie. Yeah, that was your first movie. Okay, first George movie. George Romero's Monkey Shines, mm -hmm. um, which I saw when it came out, but had forgotten <laughs> you were in it. Forgot uh, Stanley Tucci's in it. John Stanley, Pankow's in I know, it. Great actor. It's a in great it. cast. Yeah. Um, it's one of the best. You know, Romero usually used sort of amateur actors, whoever was hanging around Pittsburgh at any given time. But he <laughs> he 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 brings in some serious pros for this thing. Yeah, you some play... New York pros. Yeah, not yeah. necessarily me, but those guys, Panko and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you play such a high. You play the um the the boss who the is, boss, is yeah. badgering the uh, the scientist to start showing some results. So he pushes science places where it shouldn't go. Right. And so it's a little bit of a of a of a of a horror cliche character. But you bring so much to it. What I was struck by was all of my er early TV and film roles. I'm the lowest status guy. So I take whatever nervousness I bring to the set and I just bring it to the character. It's the easiest thing in the world. Yep. But you are so high status in that scene. You don't stand up. You're just sitting there being imperious, <laughs> dressing down Pankow. Was that a challenge or were you just able to hurl yourself into I it? I think I was uh, – I wasn't afraid of the experience because uh, – I felt like I knew what I was doing in theater. This this can't be that hard. That's fantastic. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I was overconfident and I, and I was glad that I was because I learned right after that <laughs> that uh, film is a lot harder than you think it is. Yeah. 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 But it, it's a... But it, for that role and for that time, it was like, okay, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it speaks to the, you know, the incredible importance of being on time and being prepared. Um, being so that, prepared yeah. yeah and I was I'm always and always was super prepared for stuff and for auditions especially yeah 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 the when we met it was about I don't know, five or six years ago on on Big, Big Bang. Bang Theory gotta be longer than that now yeah I guess so um I could I could look it up but I I remember where I was emotionally um <laughs> 
we we didn't have any scenes together, but on a multicam sitcom, you end up hanging out with everybody who's on set. So I I met Stephen and I met uh, Lavar Burton and and, Great. and Mark Hamill and you know it was it was, yeah. a, it was a fun set for that regard. Absolutely. You would meet some pretty crazy cool. people. New Heart, yeah, amazing. Um, but but you we had a ton of downtime. We both had about two scenes each in this particular mm-hmm. episode and we were hanging out by craft services. And I was a few years into my forties at that point and was noticing something that was happening to my field in my forties. Do you remember talking to me about this? Cause it was an interesting, like there, the herd had thinned. I was just going to say, it's like this. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, there's only people drop out of your strata and you go, Where'd they go? <laughs> That's exactly what you said. That's exactly what you said whenever that was. Was it? Yeah. yeah it was yeah. You were like, where did everybody go? Yeah. And there was a striking thing around 40, which is absolutely when my career picked up a little bit. Because mm-hmm. um, I was also like such a baby faced 30 year old and everyone was like, I don't know what to do with you. You're not a student, but you're not right. a dad. Fuck off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there was a kind of a weird like, you know, yeah. I, I played a, a really old grad student on Big Bang. That was like my hook for a while there, you know, uh-huh. but you, you. I don't even think you realized what a pep talk that was and how much I, I needed that little boost at that time. No, but that was real life. I mean, uh, I, I'd seen it 10, 10 or four more years than you. The, as as you go on in the business, the, the people drop out because of family stuff, because of financial things, they drop out. And so the, I, the watchword for having a career is just staying in it. You know, endurance is more than half of it. Yeah. Um, uh, to be able to stay in it. Um, and I remember that very much. Yeah. It, it, it was, it's been really, and yeah, it was right around 40 and, uh, and my, my work absolutely picked up. It was the damnedest thing because there were just fewer. There were people who were like, you know what? Fuck this. I can use my charm and make money in real estate. I think the thing that kept me going was also an Ed Asner story who, would just got married Tyler Moore as he was about to go. He was 40, whatever. Right. And it's like, it ain't happening. Really? But he stuck it and he got that and that was it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, uh, 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 Sydney Green Street mm-hmm. from Maltese Falcon. Yeah. Yeah. That's his one first of my film favorites. Role. Yeah. That's his first film first role. Film role. Yeah. Exactly. He's 64 years old in the Maltese Falcon. That mm-hmm. is his first time on film. Yeah. Um, We've segued gracefully to the question I ask everybody: Who were some of your favorite uh, character actors uh, growing up? I all, feel like you've got a you've got a stack. There probably is a stack, uh, and if and if I wasn't seventy, I could remember all their names. Oh, I bet you're going to come up with a couple of them. <laughs> but I loved all those guys in the '40s and '50s. You know, uh, uh, Elisha Cook Jr. Uh, sure, um, I, and for the life of me, I, I can't come up with a name right now. But I wanted to be um, uh, Frank Morgan. You know, oh yeah, sure. I wanted the, to be the, Frank the Morgan, actual wizard, and right. all the other roles in that in that movie. That's what I mean. That's what I wanted to be able to do. I didn't know that was like very unusual that he got to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that movie, but well, how how old do you how old were you when you realized it was all the same guy? Uh wow. Um, uh, probably in my teens. Yeah, his, yeah, his, yeah. Probably a little older teens. than I care to admit, but I, <laughs> right. But right. I, I remember at one point just um, uh, it, the doorman when the door when he turns out to be the doorman. I was like, holy fuck, this guy's in. He's right. just he's he's like one third of this movie is this guy. <laughs> well, the guys that I love were Struther Martin. I wanted to be Struther Martin. Okay, I did want to be Ed Asner, which I got to be on news radio, kind of. Um, <laughs> yeah, you had a you had a, a, a slightly more benevolent dictatorship to your quality because, yeah, you didn't, because Jimmy didn't give a shit as much but, as Lou did. Yeah, but I mean, I wanted to be in the milieu of different, completely different stuff. Right. Um, and I got to do that, which was, uh, I'm, I'm proud of myself for not staying with sitcoms more than 10 years and, tr- and desperately trying, not desperately, just not taking them for a while to yeah. get other... You know, the CSIs and the West Wings and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they don't see you. The casting directors will not see you until you really show them that you can do that. And then they forget again. No, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> oh, he only does drama. No, no, if you'll remember. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So did you actually talk to your agent and in like the late 90s and say, you know what, we're, we're going to kibosh the sitcoms for a little while? And well, I, wanna... I made that decision and, and said, this is what I would like to do. It was the only reason I was lucky enough to be able to do it was I was still doing King of the Hill. So I had a job. Oh, okay. I had a job and I could stop doing that other job for a while. 
and so I and I did. I went for I went for a while till I I got a couple of uh, hour dramas. Yeah, uh, and that that was very fulfilling, especially to do West Wing and that stuff. And then led to, you know, the the uh, HBO stuff, Boardwalk, and and other things like that. Well, yeah, and they, and I got the 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 movie where you play Richard Clark. There's a bunch of right, um, right, right. There's a bunch of of in the early aughts. There's this gear shift mm-hmm. where you become the guy behind the guy right. in in some, I'm speaking in very broad terms, but no, in, no, yeah. in a lot of these political dramas. Sure. Let's talk about West Wing, because you're on West Wing post-Sorkin. Correct. You're in like the John Wells years yes. uh, of the show, where yep. it's a slightly different vibe. Yeah, It's absolutely. a different vibe. It's even it's even shot differently. It doesn't have that like Gordon Willis glow over yeah. all the characters it does, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's It doesn't still... have the perfectionist thing. That, uh, that yeah. he had. I still think it's a really good show. I do too. I think it's a really entertaining and interesting political drama mm-hmm. that is maybe, frankly, a little less idealized than the first four years. I agree. Um, what was your time like on that getting on to this show that has won a slew of Emmys and, and is, you know, has launched people? Again, and... I, I, I feel like I was prepared going in. Okay. You know, it was the, the same thing, audition that you have through your life. You see seven seven different guys that you've auditioned with right, you know right, right. through the, through time yeah 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 and uh and you managed to pull out the job but i felt like i was i was ready for for that when it came along and it was interesting to play um the conservative i mean i was on the conservative side they you play a f- Alan, you've played a side. few yeah you've played a few yeah, over well, the I played years. hoover with um uh uh, in uh, LBJ, the, the That's HBO right, you movie, did. That's right. which was very satisfying to, to get to do that stuff. Um, what is it about, I think I know the answer to this, what is it about Stephen Root that they cast you as uh, conservative <laughs> so often? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's my face. <laughs> uh, gee, I don't know. Um, it's it because it's so polar opposite of you know, the broad comedies that I do, like the okay, the big uh, yeah, and uh, I, I think they like that as much as I can if they can get away with it with the casting director. Oh, just like it'd be so interesting yeah, to see. Yeah, to have him as another thing. Yeah, yeah to see, see Milton be a guy who's espousing the capital gains tax. Exactly. Anyway, who's, who's going against it, <laughs> yeah, who, who, who wants limited government and all. Uh, that's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I was jazzed when you showed up on, on West Wing. On um, uh, It's such an interesting, what I love about that era is that Alda is a not particularly religious California Republican. Uh-huh. He's not like, yeah. they don't, turn him into a one note like fire and brimstone absolutely guy he's a, yeah. he's a very complicated kind of republican who unless i'm terribly mistaken ends up working in some facet in the administration and then i was a yeah. big western fan it shows um but um <laughs> but um i got to work with ron silver and all these that's other right, ron great silver. yeah that's right stock question that i ask everybody um was there a role that got away oh I don't know if it's it's the role. No, 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 sure, you know? sure. But it's always really interesting to like imagine. Uh, uh, do you remember the sitcom Grounded for Life? Uh, yeah, Donald Logue. Donald Logue. Yeah, who I find to be one of the best. He's fantastic character actors in the world, and that was his show. Uh, it was just, it, it, and it was a sitcom, but. I thought it was better than most. No, it was very interesting, and it was sort of a weird. It was um, weird, multi-cam, it, it, single cam hybrid, completely in my milieu. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to play his dad. Oh. And wait, wait for it. Okay. Okay, I do the pilot. Oh, really? Do the pilot. I had just done another pilot before that, and it got picked up, and I couldn't do Grounded for Life. As Donald Logue's dad, and guess who got the role instead of me? I actually know, but I'd love for you to say it. Richard Reilly, who is, of course, of course the jump conclusions guy, guy from in Office, Office Space. Space. And Richard and I, you know, went up for everything. You together. must, you guys must see each other constantly. For other. we we did we worked together in uh, Black Rain. But oh my that, god, that long ago. Oh my god, and then saw each other every year since at every audition you know what he's great in <laughs> he's great in the last Harold and kumar film he plays santa claus oh i haven't seen it <laughs> you know it's ridiculous, oh I, yeah but it's a holiday staple in my fucked up household <laughs> and i recommend it highly that's it you see it's funny i i, I applaud you because usually 
the job that gets away. It's someone auditioned for something and didn't get it, but you yeah. did a pilot and had to go. Away. What, so what was do the it. series that that went? It's called Ladies Man. Wait, hang on, hang uh, on, hang on, Ladies Man. Wait, Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina, and who is friend the, of the pod? Who is uh, He's been on the show and a friend for for life? Okay, because he's the nicest man in he's the world. He's the nicest guy in the world. And this show, unfortunately, didn't work. And did you know? Did you know who was on that show? Uh, I just remember Sharon. Lewis Alf, being... Sharon Lord, Alfred Molina, Kaylee Cuoco at sixteen. Oh, really? Betty that... White. Jesus Christ. The, and me, what is it? What, what right? Exactly. What was wrong? Scripts, writer. Oh man, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Still though, um, you yeah. could do uh, you could do far worse than uh, than spending time with those actors. Uh, it, it was a joy to walk in into that room of all with all those actors, and Betty White would walk in invariably, <clears throat> you know, after everybody, and walk by the room and go, "Hey, boys." <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenal. And would flash him. And oh. She was the best. She really was. You know, everyone's like, you, you know, <laughs> no one gets a pass just because they die anymore. No. You know, like, and if something nasty was going to come out about her, we'd have heard it by now. No. But there's nothing, nothing nasty. She was a delight. She was a genuine national treasure who should be on stamps. Exactly. She, she, and Julie Harris to me. Are, oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The same. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. Cool. There has been before Barry. There was there was a run of really interesting um, sort of indie films that you you did, and, and larger indie films that you really you got enjoyed. To do. Those, yeah. Um, you've worked with the Cohen Brothers a bunch. You know, let's talk about that. Um, you worked with the Cohen Brothers, and then most recently, you worked with just one Cohen brother. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, and in your triumphant return to to Shakespeare. <laughs> Um, I loved Tragedy of Macbeth. I thought it was I, so well done. It was so done. well done. I mean, I, just... I mean, part of me it, that was like, do we need another version of the story? <laughs> I have to admit, I really, I saw it coming out. It's like, I mean, I want to see Denzel do this as much as the next guy, but there was just one six years ago yeah. with Fassbender. Yeah. It's always on TV. And then it was fucking great. Yeah. Well, I, I mean... Uh, but this was a 40s noir movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was so interesting to shoot at all at Paramount, all built. Not one outside shot. No, I noticed that. Uh, I noticed that. And it that was that was a pleasure to be able to work <laughs> back in the time where I loved all those character actors from the forties and fifties. Yeah, well, so sure. that's what it felt like. Uh, and these sets were enormous. They, they looked were, huge. They were yeah. enormous and stark, like high contrast mm -hmm. black and white lighting. Yeah, and they don't have Venetian blinds, so they do it with columns. Yeah, so they get that same sort of like you know uh, yeah. uh, effect of people's duality and and everything. Yeah. I think Joel did an amazing job and. Uh, and the cinematographer as well. The Amazing. adaptation, yeah. uh, what they, yeah, when it was done, I was like, what did they, it's an hour 45, what did they cut? And I thought about the stuff they cut and I was like, yeah, I didn't miss it, you're nope. fine. Yeah. Pretty much it, not. It, it clips along yeah. perfectly. The Porter is the um, the lone laugh <laughs> chunk, the la the lone, I mean, there's a little moments of dry well, you wit have, here and there. You have to have the 15th century dick jokes yeah. <laughs> in order for, for Macbeth to wipe off all the blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. there's got to be that scene where... <laughs> you literally need the yeah, time. Yeah, you need for, the for, time. Yeah, you, yeah. You, uh, it, it's, a, it's almost like what they used to call an apron number I yeah. think, in, in the yeah. old theater. Um, but um, is there a certain extra responsibility when you're like, well, this is it. I'm the I'm the comic relief in the tragedy of Macbeth. How do yeah. I... Uh... Uh, no, and, but I've been in that position in, in other stuff. Right, right. So right. that was... I'm very happy to fulfill that role. And it was a nice thing for me started my career and it kind of is you know late in my career now but I, to get to do it on film was great yeah, yeah yeah to have that immortalized on on something that was a hit too that went really well and people yeah saw. That great great cast uh and a colorblind cast which was really interesting and wonderful i thought yeah no it worked fine though it yeah worked, oh i did i it, thought so too it, it worked great and it was um a, just a really smart way to to take it out of you know medieval scotland yeah, and, yeah. and and make it a little more e eclectic right um what's the secret to playing drunk <laughs> it's a it's a it's a pitfall 
for uh, a lot of actors. It is uh, a lot of really good actors fall short, and I was, and you know, the the porter is a is in a long line of uh, of uh, shit faced Shakespearean characters. Mm, yeah, I think I th- I think the real answer is that you have to have been really drunk a few times okay. <laughs> to be able to call on it and go. So it's a method approach. I remember. Yeah. A little <laughs> methody for that <laughs> because I, I think if you hadn't been, it'd be difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, we're going to bounce around for a little bit here. Um, you, you mentioned that um, you, you um, might've dinged your back a little bit doing dodgeball. Yeah. A little bit. Um, uh, there was a stunt, I, you know, and, and I'm not, I, I'm not blaming dodgeball. No, this no, is no. what I, it, it, it didn't really appear till af, way after dodgeball, but I think that was the genesis of it. <coughs> I did um, a stunt on the car where the car hits Gordon. Oh, right. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and to do the stunt, I was sitting on the car. The car starts up fast and you go, boom. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was the start of my back problems. Oh, no. Uh, but it's okay because um, I'm really conscientious about if I feel anything, I go into my immediate, my rehab mode, you know, which is fine. Oh, uh, you're, you're, you're sort of. Oh, yeah. Of my PT. heat, my heat, my exercises that I, I don't not do them now anyway because um, uh, it just feels better to do them anyway. But I, I just know. got into my fifties, and I was trying to explain to a younger friend of mine the advantage is you know immediately when something's wrong, mm-hmm. immediately, and by this point you have learned a couple tricks. Yeah, and you know how not to exacerbate it. Yeah, precisely. You That's know when to not be a hero. You it, know when to be like, "Hi, that guy who has my haircut. Mm-hmm. We need him now. Yeah, <laughs> we would like the guy who wears this yep. wig. We would we'd like him to show up. Honey, where's the where's the heating pad? Yeah." Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, exactly. And, and uh, I need to lie on the back with my feet up the side of the right. wall. Yeah, and, um, and yeah. you have to do these little exercises to move you around a little. So uh, that's just that's just age, but that's okay. What comes across in in Dodgeball, which I it's funny because the movie's like fifteen years old at this point, but at its time it was kind of a throwback to the the group underdog comedies of the eighties. To a very much extent, so, you know, and but it, but raunchier. Oh, obviously with raunchier. language. Obviously yeah, raunchier. language. Yeah. yeah, but I mean there was. It's Vince Vaughn doing the the Bill Murray role from the early '80s of like right. the dry smartass underdog. Oh, I I I, just, I said I'll do this role if you let me do Rick Moranis, which is oh, what fantastic. I did. Fantastic, that was which is what I did. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. yeah. But you don't because you're such not a Rick Moranis <laughs> type that you don't see the. You don't see the. But that's uh, my homage to him. I mean, people say you just stole that from Rick Moranis. No. I, I actually, it's my homage to him because I think he was unbelievable. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah, he is. He Rick Moranis is a is a real real hero of mine. Actually, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll overshare for a brief moment. My wife, before she was my wife, when she was just a friend of mine at the Improv Theater where we were coming up in New York, she uh, disclosed one time like, "Oh my God, I had the biggest crush on Rick Moranis," and that was the <laughs> first moment in my head where I thought, "I have a shot here." <laughs> yeah, oh, this might actually pan out. Yeah, She's, you know, yeah, because it, it's not John Stamos; it's Rick Moranis. I could, I could swing for the fences and and pull this off here. Um, yeah, Rick Moranis. If he did uh, anything, if he this line will, you know, he could do nothing else, and it would be fine. It's like we'd like a piece of your brain. Okay. Yeah. God. Oh my God. You know, oh it's like God. oh, there's nothing more brilliant than the that. sheer willingness. <laughs> Okay. He's just absolute. I mean, that's yes and in a nutshell, uh, right? Like, oh, absolutely, yeah. And it's in character. Yeah, and it's fantastic. And, he, and we've just seen him play a demon beast for like a half an hour of that movie, <laughs> and now he's back down to Lewis the accountant. Um, and then right around the same time, he's the sleazy agent in Streets of Fire. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah. the the versatility is there. There's all the Second City stuff. There's uh, an incredible Woody Allen he used to do. He's just he is a wonderful guy. I don't notice the. It's funny. I, I now that you mention it, it's all I can think of. But I didn't notice the Rick Moranis homage, which is a lesson. Like if you're going to steal from somebody, steal from somebody who isn't from the child. best. Yeah, no, you steal from, from the best. best also, and I've don't... stole from many. You know, uh, not overtly, but I sure. go, oh, there would be something like this that one of my fairy character actors would do. I will, you, you're not going to you know. throw that out into the void. What, like who? Like who, no. <laughs> who from, from who else have you stolen? Oh, God, I don't know. I, 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 but I know, uh, I know intrinsically 
that 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 I've stolen from Frank Morgan, say, okay, or yeah, or yeah. or such like. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. So uh, I I don't uh, stealing from the best is okay as long as as long as you pull it off. As long as you pull it off, and 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 again, always defend it as an homage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about um, Get Out, mm. um, which is. One of those movies that improves with every viewing. Mm. It there's a lot know, of s- s- tiny, tiny things in it. Did you notice those tiny, tiny things when you first read it? Yes, you did. Okay, yeah, yeah. And yeah the, you're the, a careful f- script reader, aren't you? I am, and and that was one of those things. You know, you want to do, you want at this point, you want to do uh, not good but great scripts. Right. Yeah, uh, and so that was one. And the fact that he was able to get so small. In that uh, minutia, and he did, which he did in in the the second one as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah. Get Out was special. Yeah, I mean, there's so many little. I mean, there's all sorts of really fun videos online that, talking about the subtext and the Easter eggs peppered throughout. You know, he uses mm-hmm. the cotton to clog his ears. You know, uh-huh. all that that great great stuff. Um, but it's it it all hangs together really well. Did he talk to you? He's such a movie buff, Jordan. Um, I mean, all directors are, but he really seems to be. Oh, he is. Be, he, like, Hater. Hater is yo, huge Hater, I've, cinephile. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen Hater be interviewed on the Criterion Channel. Oh, he's, yeah. He's a big nerd, um, mm-hmm. and it's endearing. But but Jordan Peele has this this quality where he he he, he finds a subgenre, not a horror thing, but a horror subgenre, because I want to do that. And did he talk to you a little bit about what was influencing Get Out? Did he talk to you a little bit about because I always watch it and I see Rosemary's Baby. I see a ton sure, of Rosemary's Baby. Absolutely. In that movie. Yeah, no, we didn't talk about that specifically. But yeah, we, we talked about character a lot. <clears throat> um and I didn't I, I didn't want to uh, I felt a little uh oogy about doing another blind guy, which I'd done in O oh, oh, oh Brother. brother. Yeah. I didn't want it to be anything like that. Okay. So we talked about not making it like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um uh, but just in general character stuff, he was very specific. Like like Joel and Ethan are very specific. I mean, they storyboard every fucking movie to the nines, and then they get there on the day and they go, "Well, we might do this." <laughs> oh, wow. Well, you know, we actually got sidetracked. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, about about the Coens for a moment. Let's go back to them for a sec. What is the difference between working with one and two, or is there one? Are they really just no? They're says, really they're, they're two really, headed beast, right? They're two headed beast, and uh, yeah, Ethan could have you know been there in spirit and <laughs> probably was okay. Uh, no, it was the same working with Joel as working with Joel and Ethan because they both did both. You know, they both produced, they both direct, they both. Uh, yeah, they're they're one head. Have you ever gotten a contradictory note from? In the th- four or five times you've worked with them, have they ever? I don't think each so. Other? No, yeah, I don't think that's so. What I'm from the, nice, they're nice enough to let you do the free take. Oh, really? They're yeah, they, but I'm not, surprised not that. more than one. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm but they'll let you hear one though. It's such a meticulous. It's not like yeah. Wes Anderson meticulous, but there is right. a very oh, it's deliberate, very tightly scripted. Yeah, um, but sometimes some stuff gets used. So oh, that's uh, neat. Yeah, yeah, and they're very, very collaborative uh within the scope of what they do have you do you have a favorite of the stuff you've done with them oh i mean they're all so good i mean well the most fun was probably oh Oh brother right um probably the most fun but i i really like dj um (laughs) yeah uh but i really like doing um what is it one one the best picture uh, 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 oh, no country for old no men. country. Yeah, because uh, that was a, a kind of a departure for me. Um, it, it, I always play these kind of weird, strange guys, but this guy was really odd. <clears throat> and to get to work with Javier, mm. who was frightened that his hair was too weird. <laughs> and we had to tell him every day. No, the hair makes it, the hair baby. Makes it. The hair makes the it. The hair makes well, it. Well, you got You also have to like. <laughs> you have to de sexy Javier Bardem right out of the gate if he's going to play that character. Yeah. You got to. Like, yeah. You got to. You got to 
unsex he, him he here. He was worried about it, but no, we assured him every day that this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> <So> uh, I'm <laughs> telling you. Um, but yeah, I really love It's like the doing... glasses in office space, really. It's like, oh, I immediately know what I'm looking at right now, don't I? Oh, yeah. That was hard because I couldn't, I had Genuinely no depth perception. See. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. there's just no depth perception. I had to practice reaching for, for the stapler. Because I couldn't, yeah. it could be here or it could be way over there. I don't know. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Um, but yeah, so you were saying it was a it was a departure. It was a different kind of weird for you. Yeah, different kind of weird for me. Um, and, uh, and working with Woody was just so fun. Yeah, because what Woody, uh, Woody really on the free take, Woody went. Oh, he just went. It was so fun to watch him. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. and they used some of it. Oh, really? Yeah, I gotta watch that again. Yeah, I gotta watch that again. It's a very upsetting piece of work, but it's so well done. So good, and there's no music in this I know. movie. Yeah, I know. There's Which is hard for them because screen. they love music and they, they use it, it so well. I think the Mariachi's on the bridge. That's the only music. Okay, but there's yeah. no background music in this movie. It's almost like um, one of those really stark '70s movies. In the yes, movie, like it's Panic very '70s movie. Yeah, you know, where there's just there's a little music on a radio <laughs> in the background, but that's it. Like there's no scoring per se, right. and it. it it gives you this oh, just this, moving the bag in the thing is like oh, it's the isolation in that movie. I think that's what upset me so much, but it's so good. So good. Um, what um, uh, are you between Barry seasons right now? We are. Nice. We start in August nice. for season four. Nice. And you, have you seen scripts yet? I'm obviously not going to ask you to do uh, that. For I time. have seen a couple of scripts that. The day after they sent them, they said, never mind, we're going to change it all. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I don't know. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> but that's normal for, for this. It's yeah. like they get a better idea and they go, oh, no, let's just write. The, it. Because the best thing about the show is it's going, Shh, and then it goes left or right. You don't know where it's going to go. I, I mean, again, bre- I, I cite Breaking Bad because it's the last time a TV show made me gasp quite so often. Sure. You know, I mean, there's this moment after moment of, <gasps> and, and, you know, you like to think you get to my age, you're kind of jaded, you've seen it all, but it's still so surprising and the jokes work and the tension works. works. Yeah. It's, um, it's a real gem. Um, best of luck with it. Thank you, you. think you're going to come back to the stage. Uh, I, I briefly went on in 16, I went, did a show at Playwrights. That's right. Yeah. Which was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was really hard to block out that time. Oh yeah, you know, sure, sure. it's it's a long time to block out. It's a long process for a dollar fifty. It's a money side. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah, but I, I I wanted to do it for that play because it was a new play, and I got to work with Lois Smith. The end. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so. no question. And then I got to do a movie with her, Uncle Frank. Oh wow! Uh, which was fantastic. I'll admit I've not seen it, but uh, I've heard it's I'd great. I really like you to watch it. Yeah, it's one of the best indies that I've done. Oh nice. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think. I think. I remember seeing posters and being like, oh, that sounds really good. And then just, you know, things. And then I had a bunch of catching up to do to, to do this. And I had to rewatch a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And um, It's a good one. And what's great about your career and the reason you're not recognized enough <laughs> on the street is a tribute to your versatility, sir. No, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm always happy that I can be a little bit under the radar. You know, it's nice. It's, okay, it's nice. Right? Yeah. Uh, I feel very fortunate for that. Stephen Root, thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. And that is an episode wrap on Stephen Root, who is not on social media, which is probably why he is so pleasant and friendly. He begins work on season four of Barry very soon.